means I can skip about a quarter of my talk, so thanks for that. <laughs> um, and thanks everyone for coming. I, I appreciate that uh, it is a bit late in the afternoon for you in Australia. Um, yeah, like Esan said, it's 8 a.m. for me over here. Um, so uh, small sacrifices for all of us, I think. So I'll share my screen now and, and without further ado, I shall get going. So, um, so again, thanks for the invitation to give this lecture. Um, yeah, so I entitled my talk, Trustworthy Autonomous Systems, Why Do We Need Them? Hopefully I'll answer a little bit of that question. Um, and um, you've already introduced myself, so, so I should just say that this is part of um, or why I'm talking about Trustworthy Autonomous Systems is um, I'm the research director of the UKRI TAS Hub. So UKRI is, is the UK Research Innovation Funding Agency here in the UK. And um, I shall talk a little bit about the program, the TAS program. Uh, TAS stands for Trustworthy Autonomous Systems. And um, um, the TAS Hub uh, consists of uh, researchers and, and academics from the universities of Southampton, Nottingham, where I'm based, and King's College London. And in this talk, I um, shall make clear why I talk about trustworthy autonomous systems. Um, and I may, I may use the acronym TAS or AS. Um, and so what do I mean by AS or autonomous systems and why should we care about it? Shall I give our definition of autonomous systems, which is a bit broader than some of the definitions you might find in the literature. Um, then I shall give some motivating examples, um, what, what I call motivating examples of, 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 again, why we need trustworthy autonomous systems. Before I get into um, presenting some of our own research, different three different kinds of um, research kind of rolled into one talk, hopefully with a conclusion that brings it all, all together. Um, and perhaps before I get going, I should say that um, as Isam said, happy to answer your questions if we still have time at the end uh, as well. I think I'm planning on talking for about 45 minutes overall, so hopefully there's some time left. So why do I talk about trustworthy autonomous systems? Well, because of this um, large national research program uh, called the UKRI TAS program. Um, the TAS hub, which I am a part of, is the kind of central point, as the name suggests. Um, and this is funded as part of the Strategic Priority Fund in the UK, which funds multi and interdisciplinary research across 34 themes in response to these strategic priorities and opportunities um, they have um, identified at the funding agency. This, fund, this funding is £33 million over four years overall, um, of which the, the hub is a large proportion, uh, with about £12 million. Um, and then, so there's the hub and the nodes, as the picture suggests here, where you have um, kind of topical nodes um, that are addressing kind of some of the issues of trustworthy autonomous systems, such as trust, resilience, functionality, verification, security, governance, and regulations. Um, so these these topics here are not defined by us as, as the TASA, but by the by the funding agency overall. Um, so so there are kind of different aspects of autonomous systems have been investigated. Overall, over 20 universities collaborating on this with more than 100 industry partners, more than 130 researchers and more than 10 disciplines involved. Um, important to say that this is multidisciplinary, <clears throat> so it does involve um, people like myself who are um, kind of um, based in computer science, uh, groups, but um, so my area is human computer interaction, uh, and as such, is already interdisciplinary, con con um, containing psychology and sociology as well. Um, and we have those folks on board as well. And then from the humanities, and we have law and regulation people and engineers, to name just a few. Uh, so, overall, perhaps this is the world's largest program in, in trustworthy AI and autonomous systems. We're not. 100% sure, but we're claiming that that is the case. Um, <clears throat> so what is the ambition of the TAS Hub? And the ambition is to, to deliver world-leading best practices for the design, regulation, and operation of socially beneficial autonomous systems, which are both trustworthy in principles and trusted in practice by individual society and government. Um, and I think here you can see that um, already 
uh, it has quite a broad remit uh, and ambition in terms of what it wants to achieve. And I think it's important to stress the you know social beneficial nature and uh, the trustworthiness is the sort of at, at the heart of it, which means that um, I think trustworthiness is is to me is a kind of umbrella term uh, for value based um, technology. So so we are you know we are accepting that technologies are not value neutral. Um, they are imbued with the values of those that create it and, and perhaps the values of those that use it and so on. So it's, a, it's important to acknowledge that from the outset and to create technologies that represent the values that we care about. So briefly, what do I mean by autonomous systems and why should we care? Um, we, we take this kind of quite broad um, definition of autonomous systems which, as I said, is a bit different to what you might find in the literature. Uh, see it as a system involving software applications, machines and people that is able to make actions with little or no human supervision. Um, a few points of notes about this um, quite broad definition. It's a socio-technical sort of uh, systemic perspective. Socio-technical means that the system involves both human and social and technical and technological ele elements. Um, it is agnostic to the details of the application, and, and you will see that um, the broad kind of assumption, the broad kind of understanding we have of, of autonomous systems means it applies to a whole range of um, applications and domains. And uh, it defines autonomy quite broadly uh, in, in the sense of taking actions with little or no human supervision. I think the term algorithmic decision making that Aesan used earlier in his introduction as well is um, a very good one to really kind of also capture um, the kind of decision making uh, that we see it, that we see as kind of sufficient to define something as an autonomous system. So I'll, get, I'll provide, present some multi examples. I'll go through these quite quickly. Uh, many of these are probably familiar uh, to you because um, they made international headlines, I think. First of all, Again, as you already said, autonomous systems are already widespread. Um, they are already uh, part of manufacturing. We see them in transportation. Uh, we have them in, in domestic environments and entertainment, such as smart speakers and um, also the kind of the kind of um, chore, you know, uh, robotics like vacuum cleaners. Um, we see them in retail and hospitality healthcare and medicine, workplaces and offices, in finance and defense and security and policing and crime. So they are already widespread. However, there's a problem with these kinds of autonomous systems. So this is an example from 2016. And then on the right, you see a kind of a, um, a headline from the Guardian uh, newspaper. Um, so in 2016, Microsoft released this chatbot called Tay. Um, that was released on Twitter, and in in a very short space of time, in less than a day, it became kind of racist, in that it learned its language uh, from the people that it was chatting to, that the people that were chatting to it, um, and whether or not it was done maliciously, it certainly had um, a damaging and a, an offensive um, effect on people, and uh, had to be taken down by Microsoft, um, and. Again, I'm jumping around quite a bit here, but to just give you some examples of how things can go wrong. In 2018, we had um, Tesla, uh, the, the kind of famous fatal crash that occurred with the, um, where the, the autopilot was blamed for um, the, the fatal crash. Um, so the driver died at, at the scene there. And we had, uh, what, was, what was said was that the autopilot's vision failed to distinguish a kind of a gray lorry or truck turning from the gray background of the sky. And, the, but, but also the driver is thought to have had uh, his hands off the steering wheel at the time as well. And this led to the redesign of the autopilot where now you have to maintain your hands on the steering wheel or the autopilot will, uh, will not continue to work and will kind of, I'm not sure, I haven't, I haven't driven a Tesla but we'll give you some kind of warning prompt that you put your hands on the steering wheel again. I think it's a nice uh, example of, of um, 
you know, a human centered view of an autonomous system um, where it's important to have to, you know, to, to design it in such a way that human can maintain control. Um, another example is that in, in the UK, from the UK um, in the summer of 2020, the Home Office uh, had to drop an algorithm from uh, making or being involved in its decision making in terms of visas granted to um, immigrants because um, it was found to be racist and people from certain countries were more likely to be denied a visa purely based on the country where they were from. And this is based on a kind of a traffic light system of green, amber and red and um, clearly shows that, you know, simplistic notions built into these algorithmic decision systems um, can be very harmful and damaging to people. Um, another example from the UK is that um, also from the summer of 2020 during the pandemic, the uh, government had to use, uh, had, had to find a solution for the problem that a lot of our A-level students um, finishing school to go into university uh, were unable to take exams because of the pandemic. And so they used an algorithm to assess people's grades. Um, and the idea was this would involve great inflation, this would avoid great inflation. Um, however, what actually happened is that uh, nearly 40% of teachers' grades were downgraded. And this um, became known as the A-level fiasco in the UK, uh, affecting hundreds of thousands of young people and resulting in large scale public uh, pro protests and the government was forced to U-turn and teachers' grades were reinstated. And, you know, it's quite powerful, I think, these pictures here as well, I think of that kind of show, you know, that show how much even such a small thing, perhaps such as an algorithm can really affect people's lives. And of course, um, uh, be problematic. One of the things that was, contentious about this algorithm was that it was taking into account people's postcodes. So if you work from a certain area and you lived in a certain area, you will, your grades were more likely to be downgraded. And clearly that is, uh, that is a biased uh, approach to thinking about, you know, what kind of grade you deserve. It's basically saying, if you come from a deprived area, you're more likely, so you probably deserve a lower grade. Um, so clearly bias um, uh, built into this algorithm. Um, my final example is one from the USA involving computer vision, where um, Robert Julian Borchick Williams was arrested because of a faulty facial recognition system. And an algorithm had wrongly matched a CCTV image of a shoplifter to his identity. And he was actually jailed and had to kind of, you know, fight uh, for, 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 uh, for a period of time to really kind of overturn this, um, this faulty um, decision. And it turned out that there's a systemic bias in uh, due to the lack of diversity in the training data that was used to train the computer vision algorithm. And we have this problem uh, in a lot of the computer vision, especially facial recognition, where um, bias is, is, is easily built into the training data. And this is what we could call, call, call a racist bias. Um, and I don't know whether the Detroit Police Department is still using the technology at, at this point in time, but it was it was certainly still using it for um, after this after this um, incident occurred. So it's probably safe to say that we have a trust problem with autonomous systems, and we have seen that um, these examples show that they have a real impact on people and societies. Um, I think it's it, it could be taken as evidence. Um, in terms of this public and media response that uh, of which I have summarized to you, you know, given that these were based all of these stories, um, and there are many, many more that you can pick out, and I'm sure you're aware of um, for the Australian context uh, as well, um, that demonstrate um, how damaging the, these failings are. So how these systems are employed, used, and also potentially misused, and, you know, for what purposes matters a lot. Um, and the consequences of when and how they fail can be significant. Um, we've seen examples where these systems can be seen to be racist and biased in other, uh, in other, in other um, difficult and, and offensive ways, um, especially when these systems are, are employed to make decisions about other humans and how these decisions affect people, uh, not just 
other users, um, but also people who are not, you know, users of a system, right? I mean, um, a, a facial recognition system, you know, you're not, you, you're just a person in the street and you might, um, you might become uh, kind of subject to the system's uh, workings. So clearly there are ethical implications that are important to think through. Um, so th this sort of highlights the trust problem with autonomous systems uh, you know, that I think uh, they are not trustworthy and in a lot of different ways. So I think then uh, the research perspective, uh, what the research can do, what we can do as researchers and academics is to understand, one of the things we can do is to understand the nature of the trust problem in context, uh, in the context in which it arises uh, to tackle it. So that's why I want to give some examples from my own research next. I think I'm doing okay for time. Um, so the first example I want to talk about is on um, work that we've done to examine trust and participation in digital, digital contact tracing. So digital contact tracing is typically done uh, via mobile phone applications. Um, here in the UK, we have one called NHS COVID-19. And um, so typically what, the way it works is that you have um, an app on your phone. And um, I, I'm not sure what the Australian um, equivalent is called, but I'm, I'm pretty sure you probably have one as well. Um, where I've, uh, an application basically runs in the background on your phone and uh, uses Bluetooth to um, estimate the proximity of yourself to other users of the same application. And then if one of those users tests positive for COVID-19, um, then it can be, you know, the con whether or not you had contact with them can be traced back um, via the, the, the technical means of proximity sensing. So we published this, um, so in the UK, the context was that the government, um, not mandated perhaps, but strongly suggested that everybody should be downloading the app and using the app. Um, and um, the uptake has been, I'll, I'll come to talk a bit more about that, but the uptake has been reasonably high in the UK, not as high as in some other countries and not as low as in, in others as well. We published this paper, and that's, this is what this is about. This, by the way, is a QR code. If you scan it, this, this will take you through to the um, through to the paper, which is um, which is an open uh, open sourced uh, open access paper. So you can can read it on the web or download a PDF of it. And uh, this is done. Um, this is joint joint work with my colleague Liz Dalthwaite and others. And um, research is teamwork, of course. So um, all the research I'm presenting is is done in in different teams of people. Um, so what we did was uh, we ran a survey a with a representative sample in the UK uh, of just over a thousand members of the public in December 2020. So this was um, at a time when uh, the vaccine rollout in the UK just started. So it wasn't, it wasn't at all uh, the case that people were vaccinated. Um, it was only the, 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 the eldest people in the population who started to receive vaccines. Um, at this point, one in two, so just over 50%, had downloaded the app. Um, this is based on our, our survey, uh, this information. Um, and then out of those that we surveyed, though, nearly one third um, did not intend to download the app and another 8.4% uh, had already deleted the app. Um, so this shows that more than a third of people that we surveyed did, do not participate. Uh, if, you, if you want to think about digital contact tracing and the act of downloading the app as, some, as something like, you know, more akin to participation than, than using an app, right? Because it's not really the case that you are a user because the app just runs in your background, but it, it certainly is a, a uh, participation um, and to participate you have to download the app and so this um, um, against the uh, is against the benchmark um, from the WHO the World Health Organization 
um, that contact tracing uh, is successful to for it to be successful you have to trace and quarantine about 80 percent of close contacts within three days so clearly if you have a third of the population so sur um, surveying to say they are not going to participate uh, that is a problem with regards to that benchmark um then just there's lots more in the paper but just giving you some data here for some reasons for not participating um so looking at the columns here are uh, reasons for not downloading the app so these are people that have responded they will not they are intent, intent not to download the app and also reasons for deletion of the app as well so those who have already deleted the app um the the foremost um reasons given were this was a quantitative survey so these were answers um that, that we provided that people could sort of tick uh so people said they don't want to be tracked um that was one of the the highest um responses here um then i don't think it will be effective was also highly um responded and i choose not to take part in contact tracing this way uh it was also um was also ticked a lot and I don't trust the people who built the app was another was another um, uh, answer that was given quite a lot as well. Um, so looking a bit more at the trust in the app, um, we did some statistical tests that showed that those who do not intend to download the app, so that, that kind of nearly a third of the, the surveyed population, also trusted significantly less uh, than those who had downloaded the app and against all of those, those factors listed here, they trusted significantly less. For instance, that data collected is used responsibly, collect um, is stored securely, did, uh, would be deleted when the app says it will, um, that the app is reliable, will do what it's supposed to do, is basically trustworthy, and that others would download the app and that they would also self-isolate if told to do so by the app. Against all of those measures, people were less um trusted significantly less with regards to those items um so you can see the point is that those who do not intend to download the app also have also me me measure significantly lower in terms of trust ratings um than those who have downloaded the app um here's a here's a slide just um showing some of the the qualitative where we did do uh, a number of interviews as well, following up on the quantitative survey, um, which we, which some of this we are um, in the middle of uh, of publishing as well. So there'll be there'll be some more work coming out. Um, this one was just to show some, I guess, the some of the complexity of 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 trust and the, the contextual nature of trust. Um, this talks about the need to feature a validation and verification process in this. In these kinds of apps and uh, so people said i trust the system either way if it was if you know it felt legitimate and authentic and was able to identify itself properly so we can see that validation verification as it's often kind of called in computer science um is a condition of trust and then uh this is also talking about participant talking about the the fact that you would receive a phone call uh, initially with test and trace um that you know would tell you somebody would ring you and tell you that you have been in contact with someone and you should self-isolate and if this was coming from outside of the uk this could feel like a spoof or, or a scam um because you know or their landline would come up um with an international call or a no caller id I think whenever I see that, I immediately doubt the validity of the calls. Uh, and again, we can see that um, validation verification is conditional upon a trustworthy identification. And, you know, people may not answer their phone if the caller ID is unknown. And that was, in fact, a problem with the early stages of test and trace before the, the app was there. And you, um, the test and trace would work primarily on that kind of based on uh, on folks ringing ringing you up um you could say that it failed at the first hurdle because basically it became unable to trace contacts um if people don't answer their phone to you you can't trace contacts and um essentially because you know it doesn't come up people don't trust 
a phone ringing if it's an, uh, an unknown caller ID. And so to summarize that a little bit, um, what we found in terms of distrust and digital contact tracing, we found uh, an impact or a correlation um, in statistical terms that uh, distrust has on non-adoption. And we found uh, some of the things that improve trust or would need to, would be needed to improve trust. Um, features such as verification and validation are, are key to establishing trustworthiness in autonomous systems. Um, and this may make little difference for some autonomous systems, such as consumer ones, um, but for others like digital contact tracing, there can be a, a large impact, a huge impact on public health, um, in for instance, in terms of the spread of the pandemic. Um, we also found that um, disproportionately um, people from ethnic minorities uh, trusted significantly less and also adopted significantly less the uh, the application. So people from Black, Asian and minority ethnic backgrounds um, were, were significantly less trusting and, and adopted the, the application less, which shows that this kind of system uh, can also risk worsening existing inequalities um, and exclude those who are already particularly vulnerable to the virus. So um, again, I think you know the the work here shows, if I may summarize it like that, some of the problems we have with um, autonomous systems, also in terms of inclusion. Uh, and they can be they can be exclusive, and they can feel, um, uh, yeah, they, for 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 reasons such as um, systematic um, distrust in, in institutions uh, can cause problems for for adoption that need to be thought through if you want to um, roll out an autonomous system across the population. So I'll get on to talk about another piece of work now. Um, which is um, a paper that um, my student Iris has just presented at CUI, Conversation Youth Interfaces. And this is work done uh, again with a, a range of other colleagues as well. And again, here's a QR code if you want to uh, grab a copy of the PDF and have a look at the paper. So this um, changes tack a little bit in that we are now looking at voice assistance as an example of an autonomous system and um, looking at the effects of wording and gendered voices on the acceptability of those systems in future autonomous vehicles. I'll just leave that up for a second here in case you wanted to scan the code. Um, so, okay, changing tack a little bit to um, this kind of futuristic, if you want, um, type of autonomous system of self-driving cars or autonomous vehicles, if you want, where there is a kind of a rise in commercial popularity of those systems. But of course, a lot of this is also still science fiction and really we do not have fully self-driving vehicles yet, not, not properly. Um, what you see is is more the kind of there are different levels of autonomous vehicles, and we are probably at level four or uh, uh, level three or four in terms of what is commercially available right now when it comes to these systems. Um, but what we're not interested in this work so much is the autonomous vehicle itself, but this idea that you have a you have a, a voice assistant um, in the in the car that can act as some kind of mediator or control interface um, where where which which provides you with information regarding the driving perhaps as well as um, control of the the vehicle um, and because of the because of the safety critical nature of driving of course this you know there are some some important things around um, engaging of attention. So, so I think 
Um, this picture here is is kind of that is a misleading vision, and you know we've seen that with the Tesla um, crash. Um, this this is not the kind of um, the kind of scenario that um, that we want in terms of people in autonomous vehicles. We don't want them to be completely switched off from the driving task and reading a book. Um, so it's it's vital though that because you have this kind of self-driving mode, um, that there is a kind of a, a, a inability to engage the attention of the driver. And so what we were interested in in this research is looking at the gendering of the voice assistant voice. So we have, um, so we have seen in related work that that can have an effect on how, well, on its anthropomorphism, so the, the human likeness in, in, according to which people perceive it, and there is related work um, that somewhat simplistically says um, people prefer female voices, and that's the sort of the default in a lot of the digital assistants that we have at the moment. Out of the box, they often have a female voice. Um, however, we wanted to prompt this a little bit more in this work, and um, I'll show some examples. I'll, I'll get into that a bit more. The other thing we were interested in is the wording of the prompts because you have the safety critical nature of driving. So the way in which the, the, the prompt is worded um, was something and how it affects the kind of acceptability was something we were interested in. Um, so those are the two things, those are the two kind of independent variables we investigated in this work. And we had a research question here, um, how do gendered voices and the wording of the prompts affect the acceptability of the voice assistance for driving scenarios? And this was broken down into the acceptability uh, in terms of how it's affected by its gendered voice, different gendered voices, and how it's affected. So the acceptability by the wording of the prompts. And by prompts, I mean the kind of, you know, the things it says, the statement it makes, um, the, the voice assistant when it comes on. So what we did was we had 18 participants, um, nine male and nine female, um, and they were between 19 and 55 years old and came from the UK, the UAE, and India. Um, and in terms of study design, basically, this is a kind of a classic three by three factorial uh, within subject design, where we had you know three levels on the factor gen voices and three levels in the wording. I'll give some examples of that. And then we had six um, handover and handback scenarios. So handover and handback is when you transfer control to the car, and that's, um, can never, I can never remember which one is handover and which is handback. I think hand back is when you transfer control back to the car, and hand over is when the car transfers control over to you. So they're kind of switching from self-driving to, um, to human driving. Um, and of course, those are, those are kind of critical moments when um, the driver needs to be engaged. And this was counterbalanced. And this is what the experiment looked like. This was done during the pandemic, hence why it was an online experiment. Um, so people were set at their own computers. And they were, um, this was a kind of, if this, you can imagine this is a kind of a screen share, what you see in the, in the in those two windows, you can see. So um, Iris would show them a video and, um, and a questionnaire and provide a kind of a description of the scenario um, that would be read out. And then she would uh, play an audio clip and I'm gonna play this audio clip for you now. Hey, a bridge is approaching and I think I could take over if you'd like. So there's an example there of one of the voices we had and um, this was an informally worded prompt as you can imagine. I mean, as you can sort of tell by the way it's worded, it's a bit unusual um a bit casual um but that was exactly the kind of thing we were we were interested in then they were asked to fill out this during study questionnaire and that was repeated for each of the nine driving scenarios and at the end there was a final study questionnaire and a short interview um so we had three different voices we had the joanna voice the matthew voice which were the the female sounding and the male sounding voice and then we also had a gender ambiguous voice called we, um, the Jordan voice. So I'll, I'll play you. You just heard the Joanna voice there, and this is the Matthew voice. Hey, a bridge is approaching. 
and I think I could take over if you'd like. And now the gender ambiguous, um, the Jordan boys. Hey, a bridge is approaching, and I think I could take over if you'd like. Okay, so those were the three voices we we had. I think it's important to stress that um, we, and we make this quite clear in the paper, what we're not suggesting is that we are comparing female, male, and gender ambiguous. Really what we're comparing is just these three voices, so the Joanna voice, the Matthew voice, and the Jordan voice, which each have their own idiosyncratic qualities. And that's really important when you think about gendering of voices, isn't that? It's not that you are you can make statements about all the female voices in the world, of course, but you can just make statements about the voices that you have selected. Um, and what we found was that the male Matthew voice was significantly more desirable and less artificial than the Jordan voice. Now, if you think about that, makes sense. If you think about um, the, the artificial, at, at least the Jordan voice, we tweaked the SSML. Um, the pitch, the rate, and the volume of the voice to make it sound somewhere between male and female, but that may also have introduced this artificial um, sounding uh, quality as well. And so you had people somewhat referring to using words such as freaky or artificial female voice uh, when they talked about the Jordan voice. And that that's also the case because you had um, the, the voice was based on the jo on the Joanna voice, so we used the Joanna voice as a bass voice and tweaked it, so people could sort of hear that it was, you know, based on a female voice as well. And we already know from related work that humans tend to pull gender ambiguous voices into a male or female category based based on previous experiences. You know, gender ambiguous voices is not 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 something you you would necessarily encounter um, a lot in your um, in your experience of hearing hearing human voices. Um, and so not any voice can be manipulated to sound gender ambiguous necessarily. And we're not saying we did a particularly good job here. Um, but it makes a point that also we need as as designers uh, of voices, for instance, or you know, they need better control over the auditory qualities uh, and the conversational interfaces um, that you to to create conversational interfaces um, that that can have you know um, better sounding gender ambiguous voices um, with regards to comparing male and the male and the female so the Matthew and the Joanna voice um, the, the the Matthew voice was rated more desirable and less artificial. However, they, these differences were not significant. So you could as well say that there were no differences, no perceived differences in terms of acceptability, right? Well, this is what we were measuring. Um, so we, we interpret this as an encouraging sign for gender equality, and we do not therefore replicate the kinds of studies in the past that have suggested uh, or this kind of notion that people prefer female voice we did not find this we do, we did not find a significant difference between a male and the female sounding voice so um this goes against the stereotypes of the informative male and friendly female which is often uh it's been the kind of the stereotype is that uh, people prefer male voices for in information and female for friendly uh, for friendliness. However, we did not find this. Uh, I think it's important to relate our work to the sociophonetics. Uh, sociophonetics is um, is an area of phonetics that um, that thinks about the effects that qualities of the voice have uh, on how it is perceived and how social status can be perceived and things like that. So things like dialect, accent and um, also pitch and you know age all of the kind of um, feature all of the, a lot of these kind of qualities of people uh, will be reflected in their voice and um, can have uh, an impact so it's important also when you design artificial voices to, to understand that understand the ways in which voices have an impact and if you think about a lot of the digital assistant voices they sound very um, 
kind of I'm going to say middle class uh, white American or in you know what British the same as well so they have a very kind of vanilla accent uh, or dialect and nobody actually speaks like that or very few people in the UK actually speak like uh, that kind of middle of the road British kind of Oxbridge voice dialect that you that you you hear if um, if if you turn your voice um, assistant to a British uh, British language Br British uh, voice, and so we think this there should be a move away from this one voice fits all approach uh, in voice assistants, and um, and yeah, and I shall just move on in the interest of time and. These are this is the these are the findings regarding commanding and uh, the, the wording. So we ended up doing this as collapsing the commanding and formal together because people didn't perceive them as, as different enough. So we have a commanding formal category and then we have an informal category that we ended up comparing. And the commanding and formal uh, prompt was rated significantly higher on these 10 measures of acceptability. So far more significant differences here for the wording that we found for the gender. Um, so they found that the commanding and formally worded prompt was, you know, more acceptable, effective, understandable, useful, appropriate, assertive, and also better at raising alertness. And this aligns with a lot of research that a more assertive voice leads to faster reaction times. Um, and shall just move on and summarize that we, think our results, as I mentioned, should not be interpreted as a general gender preference. We compared those three specific voices. And what we find, though, is that there should be a move away from the one fight, one voice fits all approach. Um, in terms of commanding and uh, in terms of, terms of the wording, commanding and formally worded prompts were the most um, preferred ones. And as I said, when I spoke about sociophonetics, these the kind of complexities and idiosyncrasies of voices should also be considered when designing artificial voices as well. So I have a final piece of work that I wanted to speak about, and um, I think I have time. Uh, this shouldn't be as long. I'll probably just do five more minutes. Um, so this one changes tech and another area of interest of ours is human robot interaction. Um, this one uh, investigates the trustworthiness of human robot teams. So different kinds of trust or so the trust between humans and robots and the trust between uh, what we call team trust and the trust and uh, there's also some sort of thing you might call task trust between humans and robots. Uh, so how how much do you trust the robot to do a certain task for instance? And this was again this is one of the task projects that looked at this and um, this is a user study uh, in in this kind of lab setting i'll just play the video here there's no sound to it there's sound but um you can just sort, sort of glance at it i'll just talk over it um what we have here is a uvc disinfection robot so a, a robot that uses uv light a uvc light to disinfect um the spaces that it passes and we were interested in understanding whether people feel reassured. Uh, so this is about a certain kind of construct or concept called reassurance. So how reassured people feel uh, when they know that a UBC robot is disinfecting this uh, space. And this was a kind of set up as a seminar room, you know, a learning space where you might attend a seminar or a lecture or a talk. Um, and yes, it's a very small one, but that's all the space we had available here in the lab. Um, and we also wanted to understand the use of professional cleaners who um, might feel threatened in their jobs by such a device because it might be seen to be taking their jobs away because this is the job of the of professional human cleaners normally to disinfect surfaces. And we wanted to understand how experiencing different approaches, uh, so things like visualizations, um, de and data about the cleaning and the quality of it would affect their reassurance as well. And you can see that as part of um, what you see here, the video is, the, is one of the things we showed the participants to um, give them, to show them 
what you know the the the, the kind of disinf disinfecting of the space in action. Another thing of note is that UVC light is harmful to humans. So humans cannot be in the same room or should not be in the same room um, as the when the robot is in operation. So we had a study design where we had 23 participants, 13 of them were professional cleaners. And we did a classic kind of pre-study questionnaire. Then there were three experimental conditions. Um, and this is, I'll just talk through those a little bit. The first condition was they just saw a sign saying, this space has been, has been disinfected by our UVC robot before entering the room. Um, and then we basically gave them, after each of the conditions, a questionnaire um, regarding how reassured they felt. Um, and the second condition, then they were shown this video that I just showed you. Um, the kind of we said this was a live video, so that you know you can see the robot live, kind of disinfecting the room. Um, and then again, we asked them, we asked them um, to 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 complete the survey, and we also asked them where they would sit on. You see that layout, and, and we wanted to understand whether people change their choice of where they would sit um, as a kind of behavioral metric of um, you know, and behavior change with regards to the information they had um, in terms of disinfecting. And then finally, we, we're showing them, we showed them this visualization that you see here on the screen on the right as well, um, where we're saying that um, basically showing them a heat map, which you know, gives some sort of impression. You can see the layout of the tables and chairs that you've just seen in the room. And we showed them this and asked them again, you know, would you change based on this picture, would you change your seat choice? Um, and then we did a final kind of questionnaire and in, in interview as well. So show you some findings. Uh, in terms of the quantitative findings, um, there were higher, if you look at the, the first two uh, di um, the first two charts here, there were higher trust ratings, but there were no significant differences for these two questions, which were, I feel reassured to use the space knowing that the robot disinfects it. And the second one, I trust the robot does a good job at disinfecting the space. And then for the final one, there was a significant effect, um, which was, I feel I had enough information to trust that the robot is doing a good job at disinfecting the space. So after the third condition, people felt they had you know, significantly more information or that you know they agreed significantly more that they had enough information when they had seen or when they had had all the information so they had seen this you know known that it's been disinfected they had seen the video of the robot doing it and they had seen the visualization as well and then also 10 of the participants changed changed their seat choice during condition two due to the of the UVC robot as well. So the robot ran on that left-hand side rather you know, than the right. So they would choose a seat on the left-hand side of the aisle. Um, and so from a, doing a qualitative analysis, thematic analysis of the interview data, there's generally a consensus that participants um, uh, agreed that when they had more information that it led to uh, an increased understanding and also increased trust in the robot and vice versa. Um, however, a group also explained that their trust stemmed from the university doing the research. And I think this is an important thing when you think about doing any kind of trust related research um, because of the contextual nature of trust, um, you have to think about the framing of the research. And the heat map did have an influence on the seat choice, um, and most participants explicitly changed their seat and kept their seat only if it was already located in a green safe space area. Uh, however, the heat map was also um, contentious, so it had some negative feelings associated with it. People felt stressed or, or worried about seat choice, uh, for example, whether the good seats were still available, and as a result, made them feel less safe. And also they thought the colors were confusing. So there's also problems with this kind of um, visualization. So in conclusion, um, reassurance as a proxy of trustworthiness, uh, we think is an interesting thing to think about. And context matters when it comes to defining how to approximate trust. Uh, 
in you know in all kind of trust related research. Trust is a multifaceted phenomenon. Um, we've seen here that the fact that it was based in the university, um, the ins you can't get away from the fact that the institution that deploys it is maybe trusted. Um, so, and that may be more important than the tech itself. Um, more information, not always better. We found that the visualizations were not, um, you know, had some problems and would need to be, would need to be um, addressed and rectified. And also more information you provide, um, the less clear and accessible it might become. And you need to start thinking about things like literacy. What literacy do you need um, if, you, if you show some data visualizations to the general public? How accessible is that to interpret and, and, and make correct inferences about the information that you're showing? Okay, so that is, it concludes my three examples from our research. So I just have the final slide, which is what does it mean for task research? I think what I was trying to get a, a across really with these three talks is, is just what constitutes trustworthiness is context dependent. And so if you're in, if you're interested in researching trustworthy autonomous systems, you need to do it in some sort of context. Um, Although you may, there may be some generic lessons that you learn that, that apply across domains and applications as well. So we had these three examples, um, public health related digital contact tracing, which can be seen as a kind of a government mandated intervention and therefore engenders a certain kind of distrust in a lot of people already because it's from the government. Um, we have seen uh, how distrust affected the adoption and disproportionately so for ethnic minorities, which also correlates with lower trust in government and UK institutions by those folks as well. So if adoption and uptake matters, then it's important to involve trusted parties. Um, and in the UK, there, what has been successful is to involve community groups in building that trust um, amongst certain groups of people to, um, to, to feel that they can trust and, and, and use this kind of uh, system. With the voice agent example in autonomous vehicles, we've seen the gendering and the wording of voices um, affect how the voice is perceived and the acceptability of it. Um, and when you're gendering voices, it's not just, a, it's not about the gender per se, but the specific voices and the sociophonetic subtleties that come with that. So suggesting kind of a move away from the one size fits all approach so considering local and regional dialects can be important. And finally, with the robots example, uh, it's hard to get past the fact that you have got a framing um, of the study, such as a university, when you are wanting to measure trust, that's going to be a confounding factor. Um, and also more information is not always better because that might, might also exclude certain parts of the population. So it's important to think about how inclusive these things are really when you, when you build them. So, Overall, if you're aiming to study trustworthiness of any kind of technology, whether it's autonomous or not, but the framing really matters.